I've just realized how reflective that neon sign is on these iPads. Ugh, that's annoying. Okay, anyway, hey guys, I'm Tom Tech Jab, and I have every single iPad you can buy right now from the standard base iPad, which will cost you 319 quid, to the brand new iPad Air fifth generation. This has just come out and it's got this snazzy new blue color and the M1 chip all the way up to the pros. And in fact, this Pro 12 9, uh, top spec, maxed out, all the bells and whistles will cost you over two grand. So which one should you actually buy? And also are any of these accessories worth shelling out for? And if you do find this helpful, then a cheeky little like and subscribe would be very much appreciated. So these are the five main iPads that Apple sells right now with various color and storage options in either Wi-Fi or Wi-Fi plus cellular. If you have money to burn and can't possibly hotspot from your phone or use Wi-Fi, they're all running the latest version of iPad OS. And as I'm filming, we're on 15.4, which actually added some nifty features like universal control, which I'll come back to later. Also bear in mind that while I'll come to some proper performance benchmarks later, the A13 chip in here, the A15 in here, and the M1 that's used in these three, while there are performance differences, fundamentally they all run the same apps and games. They also all have great build quality and materials, front and rear cameras, and they all should get around 10 hours of battery life. You can't go wrong with any of them, but it comes down to do you need the extra power, the better screen, and the better cameras of the higher end models? But let's start at the budget end with the iPad. Just the iPad, although technically it's the ninth generation iPad, and this will cost you £319 or $329. This came out back in September 2021, so it's still pretty recent, although it is definitely a case of meet the new iPad, same as the old iPad. It's kind of like the iPhone SE of iPads. I mean, it looks almost identical to most iPads from the last 10 years or so, with the same thick bezels, top and bottom, a physical touch ID home button, and also the less versatile lightning port. There's nothing wrong with the design per se. I mean, it's still slim and comfortable to use. It just feels a bit last, last, last gen. But I would argue to maybe look past that because this will do 95% of what most people use an iPad for. And for 319 quid for the 64 gig storage option, and even less if you're buying it with the education discount, you're getting pretty much the full iPad experience for just over half what you'd pay for the new iPad Air. So front and center is this 10.2 inch Retina LCD screen. Interestingly, they are all the same sharpness. They share pretty much the same pixel per inch density, except for the mini actually, which is the sharpest out of all of them. But there is one small downside. The display isn't laminated. So there's actually a small but just noticeable gap between the glass and the actual screen, but it's not the end of the world. Oh, that's creepy. Tech chap inception. Uh, we do get this eight megapixel camera on the back, which is okay for taking the quick snap or maybe, you know, scanning a QR code. While the 12 megapixel ultra wide selfie camera is actually very good. And it also comes with Apple's clever center stage technology, which tracks and keeps your face or a group of faces centered in the frame. And actually all iPads do now support center stage. Now on paper, the biggest drawback with the base iPad is the fact that we have the slower A13 chip. Certainly it's not as fast as the A15 and the M1 and the other iPads, but it's still very capable. And as you can see, it easily handles any app or game I throw at it, and it likely will do for at least a couple more years. So if you want something just for browsing the web, watching some videos, maybe making the odd FaceTime call, realistically, this is all the iPad you need. And actually it's great for kids as well. My uh, nephew Oliver loves this. I love my iPad so much. And he plays loads of logic puzzles and maths and language games. Plus being the cheapest iPad, it's less of a big deal if it gets a bit messy or worse. Hi, I'm Oliver, the tech chap. You can also pair the iPad with the smart keyboard, uh, which snaps on magnetically and then folds to keep the iPad in place. And it's pretty comfortable to type on, although it is a fairly basic experience versus the more expensive Magic Keyboard with the Air and Pros. We do also get Apple Pencil support with the standard iPad, but it's still only the first gen pencil, which charges somewhat awkwardly and also doesn't snap onto the side, but it's fine. I would stick with the base 64 gig model though. For the base iPad, I don't think it's really worth paying the extra for more storage. And if you can live with this slightly more dated design, then why pay more? All right, onwards and upwards. Well, small words. Let's talk about the iPad mini or the sixth generation iPad mini. And you know what? Don't listen to the haters when they say this is just a big iPhone. 
I love this thing. Yes, it costs more than the regular iPad, but then it's got a nicer design, better tech, and in many ways, it's just a shrunken down, ultra portable version of the Air. And it actually does just about fit in your pocket. Just, I wouldn't recommend sitting down like this, uh, but it is also by far the lightest iPad, meaning it's the only one you can use for, say, reading one-handed for longer periods. And it's also the perfect pairing with the Apple Pencil 2 for drawing and taking notes. It's funny, when my wife Sarah asks if she can borrow one of the iPads, I usually go to, you know, pick up the 12 9 and give it to her because it's the best iPad, but she never wants it. She always takes the mini, partly because she just likes the more portable, smaller size of it. It's always useful to have a wife who appreciates small things, uh, but also partly because she loves purple and I've got the purple case with it as well. So interestingly, even though, you know, on paper you might think this is best because it's the most expensive, not everyone needs it to be that big. Okay, I'll stop now. I think the small size has an even bigger advantage though for gaming. Playing games, especially ones designed for landscape orientation, works really well on this and my thumbs can reach most of the controls, although I'm not so keen on the volume button placement when I'm playing it like this. It's also powered by the A15 Bionic chip, which is the same one used in the current iPhone 13 range, and it does feel a bit quicker than the standard iPad with the A13, and more graphically intensive games are noticeably smoother. Now the Mini does have a lot in common with the iPad Air. Slim bezels, squared off design, stereo speakers, also a Touch ID power button on the top edge, as well as a 12 megapixel rear camera and a 12 megapixel ultra wide selfie, again with center stage. Also Wi-Fi 6 and a 5G cellular option if you want, plus we get the more versatile USB-C port. As I mentioned earlier, this is actually the sharpest iPad in terms of pixel per inch density versus everything else. It's not something you'd really be able to notice unless you put your eyes right up to it, but either way, this is a beautiful 8.3 inch IPS screen. The only downside really, and this also applies to the base iPad and the Air, is that we're still locked to this 60 hertz screen. Only the Pro models get the ProMotion 120 hertz. It doesn't feel like we're really unlocking that much performance with the more powerful chips because the screen is still capped at that 60 hertz. Also, this does only come with four gigs of RAM compared to eight on the new iPad Air. It's also not exactly cheap at 479 pounds or $499, which makes this 64 gig mini a hefty 160 pounds more expensive over the 64 gig regular iPad. And if you want the extra storage, 256 gigs is 619 pounds. Add in 5G, then you're at 759, and that's before a case, a pencil, or a keyboard. Well, actually not really a keyboard because they don't offer one for this size, but you can use separate Bluetooth keyboards if you want. One other reason you may want to consider going for the mini or any of these in fact, is that it supports the Gen 2 Apple Pencil, which is a lot nicer. Firstly, if I can actually pick this up, it nicely clips onto the side so you don't have to carry it separately. It also wirelessly charges this way, so it's incredibly convenient and it is more responsive than the first gen pencil with that horrible lightning connector up there. Although again, you will still get better performance, better responsiveness by using it with one of the 120 Hertz Pros. I love I've got a little pencil holder here. Feels like I'm at school or I'm a teacher, but for, you know, tech students. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the new kid on the block, the brand new fifth generation iPad Air. And I think in this 64 gig form, yes, still 64 gigs, it is arguably the sweet spot of the iPad range. The design may look pretty much identical to the fourth gen Air, but the performance is now iPad Pro level thanks to the M1 chip and also twice the RAM, now at eight gigabytes. There's also a new 5G cellular option and also USB-C transfer speeds are now twice as fast. It also gets the upgraded 12 megapixel rear and ultra wide selfie cameras with center stage. And the camera quality is better than last year as well thanks to the improved image processing from the M1 chip. Although realistically, I think the biggest upgrade with the Air and maybe the reason to buy it is this snazzy new blue color, which I maintain is Tech Chat Blue. I think Apple are just a big fan of the channel and decided to uh, create this color just for me. Possibly, maybe not. <laughs> but I am kind of torn about the new Air because on one hand, it still has this gorgeous design. It's just as powerful as the Pros now and with a screen that's almost as bright. In fact, it can feel like an iPad Pro, but for almost 200 pounds less. It's also slightly lighter than the base iPad, and for a lot of people who want a little bit more premium look and feel, I think the Air is probably worth it, especially with the improved performance and also accessories like the Magic Keyboard that gives it plenty of laptop-like potential. 
While the Air's 60 hertz display does still feel nice and smooth and is obviously a very fast iPad, it kind of feels like that 60 hertz bottlenecks all that performance potential. Ugh, but this is where I always get frustrated with Apple. They are masters of the upsell. I apologize I use that phrase in most Apple videos recently, but they know most people just want, say, 128 gigs of storage, which is why they give you 64 or 256 gig options. On balance, I do think the base 64 gig model is still probably my recommendation at 569 pounds. I don't think I would wanna pay 719 just to go up to 256 gigs of storage. Yes, of course, you can always just use iCloud to back up your stuff, but the trouble is with that 256 gig model of this, you're only 15 pounds shy of the iPad Pro 11, which does come with 128, so admittedly not the 256, but 128 is all you need. And you do get some nice extras with this, which we'll come to in a second. So that's where this kind of gets a bit blurry between whether you should get the Air or the 11 inch Pro. Just a quick side note though, because if you are serious about using your iPad for some actual work or productivity, whatever you wanna call it, then I would highly recommend paying the extra and getting the Magic Keyboard. This works with both the Air and the Pro models. It is quite expensive. And also you can see this is not the correct version for the Air. This is for my 12.9 Pro, but there is a model for this. And surprisingly, while the keycaps are a little bit bigger on the 12.9 version, it is still just as comfortable to type with on the smaller 11s. I really do love the Magic Keyboard. It acts as a protective case, there's a ton of adjustability, it attaches magnetically, so it's easy to put it on and take it off, and you get an extra USB-C port and a touchpad. If you wanna save some cash though, then you can still go with the Smart Keyboard Folio, but that does lose the trackpad, the extra USB-C port, and the nicer keys and layout and the adjustability. And finally, let's talk about the iPad Pros. You've got the 11 and the 12.9 inch here, and really this still feels like a tablet, whereas this feels more like a laptop screen. And I think again, like the Air, these really do benefit from uh, pairing it with a Magic Keyboard and maybe a Pencil too. It's not just the size that separates these though, because the bigger 12.9 gets this fancy liquid retina XDR mini LED display. And essentially we're getting much higher contrast. And so it makes the blacks on the 11 inches liquid retina screen look washed out and grayish in comparison. As for brightness, in non-HDR content, the difference really isn't that obvious as both peak at 600 nits, but when you do jump into some HDR video, we get 1000 nits on the 12.9's mini LED screen, with areas peaking up to 1600 nits, and that is a big difference. If you are watching a lot of movies or doing color sensitive work, it does make a big difference. Although being mini LED as opposed to say OLED or AMOLED, we do see some fairly obvious blooming and haloing, particularly when you've got a high contrast area, say between a white and a black. Both Pro models do get that 120 Hertz refresh rate though, or what Apple calls Pro Motion, which makes scrolling and jumping between apps and browsing the web feel so much smoother and snappier versus the air. And it's even more obvious in games with a 120 Hertz mode. It feels like you've really unlocked the M1's potential. Now, obviously I can't actually show you what 120 Hertz looks like in this 60 Hertz video that I'm filming, but if I show you both slowed down to half speed, then you get some idea of the difference. And it makes inputs with the pencil feel more immediate and responsive as well. So if you do plan to use this as a serious drawing tablet, then I think ProMotion is a must have. Like the new Air though, the M1 is just blisteringly fast. It's overkill for most tasks. But if you are a power user working with 10-bit 4K video or high megapixel images or 3D design, then it is definitely the one to get. And of course it makes it more future-proof. But aside from the size and also the screen difference, these are pretty much identical. We get the same sleek aluminum design like the Air and the Mini, although with slightly thinner bezels, we also get insanely good quad speakers, as well as Face ID instead of Touch ID. Storage also goes up to a whopping two terabytes if you've got incredibly deep pockets. The pros now also get eight or 16 gigs of RAM, depending on the storage option you go for, as well as an even faster USB 4 port that supports Thunderbolt 3, as well as a 5G option. And also both pros get a 12 megapixel main camera plus an ultra wide lens, along with a now familiar 12 megapixel selfie with center stage up front. We do also get a LiDAR sensor on the Pro models, which surprisingly I do use quite a bit, mainly for measuring things like packages when I'm sending them off or furniture. It's not essential, but it's kind of nice to have. But as you would expect, none of this comes cheap. The 11 inch Pro starts at 749 pounds or 999 if you want the bigger 12.9. 
Interestingly though, the iPad Pro 12.9 costs the same as the MacBook Air. Although this obviously doesn't come with a keyboard, you have to pay extra for that. So in that way, it becomes more expensive. For me, I would probably go with the MacBook Air, although it does come down to your circumstances. Fundamentally, I still think iPads and tablets generally are a bit more of a luxury than a necessity like a phone or a laptop. And also whether mini LED and the larger size is worth an extra 250 pounds over the 11 really comes down to how you use your iPad. For most of us, I don't think it's essential. So that is the lineup, but since I have them all here, why not run a few benchmarks and just see how fast they are? And to the surprise of absolutely no one, the M1 kind of dominated, particularly in multi-core and graphics performance, as you can see from my Antutu Geekbench and 3D Mark results. Actually, in the 3D Mark graphics test, the Mini was around 35% faster than the regular iPad, while the Air averaged twice the FPS versus the base iPad. Interestingly though, the Air was a little bit less consistent in its low frame stability score versus the Pros. It seems to throttle a bit more easily, although I didn't really see any stutter in my gaming tests. The thing is though, since most developers optimize their apps and games for the least powerful iPad on the market, often you're not really fully unlocking the potential of the M1, the more powerful chips in these guys. So really the difference comes down to if the game or the app supports higher graphic options, uh, and also you can max out the 120 hertz if it supports high refresh, but also more importantly, I think it's future-proofing. All these iPads, if you buy them right now, will probably last you at least three, four, five years. But with the M1, since it is such an upgrade and also so ubiquitous uh, within Apple's iPads and Macs now, I think you're gonna get a couple extra years of support from it. The good news though is that battery life is great no matter which iPad you go for and the difference between them was only a few percentage points at most. Realistically, in everyday use with a bit of gaming and watching videos and browsing the web, you are gonna get between nine and 11 hours. I think it's also worth mentioning that if you own a MacBook Air or Pro laptop or a Mac mini with a screen like I've got over there, actually that's the Mac Studio with a studio display, you can use these iPads as a second screen via sidecar, either wirelessly or via USB-C. And if you're on the latest Mac OS, 15.4 or later, we now get universal control, which lets your Mac and iPad become a single workspace by allowing you to share the trackpad and keyboard between devices and even drag apps and transfer files between them via AirDrop it genuinely feels like magic. So that was a lot to take in, but let me finish with a few quick takeaway tips. Number one, think carefully before you pay extra for more storage. Are you really gonna use it because it often does add a lot of money and maybe you can get away with just transferring things off it or storing in iCloud. Secondly, I wouldn't really recommend paying the extra for the cellular option, whether it's 4G or 5G, unless, I don't know, it's on the business and you don't really care how much it costs and you think you will use it. Most of the time I just hotspot from my phone and use the internet that way or, you know, use Wi-Fi. Thirdly, most people don't need a pro. I would probably recommend one of these for 95% of people. And lastly, don't forget about refurbs or buying an older version, like the iPad Air Gen 4, the outgoing one, you may now be able to find some good deals on. Official refurbishments are still quite expensive, but it's still worth looking around. And actually I saw some Amazon discounts on the 11 inch Pro, which actually made it much closer to the current new iPad Air in price. So I reckon if I was gonna buy an iPad for say my parents, I would go with something like this. Uh, I think if it was a recommendation to my friends who are a little bit more techy perhaps and uh, would use more of the features, then I would go between the mini and the new Air. Really, it just depends on what size they prefer. And then really only if you're a proper enthusiast and you want the best features and maybe money isn't as much of a problem, then I, would I recommend the Pros. The 12.9 stands out with that mini LED screen. So I like this. This is what I actually end up using most of the time myself but it is a lot of money. And at that kind of price, if you don't have a modern laptop, then maybe a MacBook Air or something would be a better option. And breathe. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching, guys. If you have any questions at all, or also any tips, then let me know in the comments below. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button, and I'll see you next time right here on The Tech Chat.